Hello, everybody. I uh, hope you can hear me. Uh, welcome uh, to this webinar on knee pain uh, 101. I'm Dr. Tom Pevney. I'm an orthopedic surgeon uh, with Valley Ortho. And as the name implies, we see patients uh, throughout the whole valley. We have offices in Aspen, uh, Willits, uh, and in Glenwood, and along the I-70 corridor uh, as well. Uh, so thanks for taking time out of your evening uh, to join me for this uh, exciting talk on uh, knee pain. And I just would like to remind everybody that uh, you can submit questions, and some of these will answer uh, throughout the presentation, and other ones I'll answer uh, at the very end. Um, so let's get started. Let me see if I can figure out how to. So the foundation uh, of orthopedics is really uh, anatomy. So what I'm going to do is just go over some basic knee anatomy. I think it'll make uh, the rest of the talk a little bit easier uh, to follow. Uh, and knee anatomy is very interesting uh, in my mind. I loved anatomy in uh, medical school. We got to dissect cadavers and they look kind of like this specimen. Uh, and this is looking at the back of a right leg. So you can see the buttocks up top here. Uh, and then these are the hamstring muscles that come down the back of the leg. Then these are the gastrocs um, that are the calf muscles. And this part of the knee, the back of the knee, uh, is kind of the dark side of the knee. We try not to go back there. There's a lot of bad structures, scary structures back here. There's a big vein artery and nerve that we try to stay away from. And fortunately, most of the pathology that we see does not occur back here, but occasionally it does. Uh, we had a patient a week ago or so that we had to make a big dissection in the back for a fracture that they had in the back of their knee. And you guys have probably heard of uh, what's called a Baker cyst or a popliteal cyst. Uh, and it's like a little water balloon that forms in the back of the knee. And this is where they tend to form kind of this little triangle in the back of the knee. And now we're gonna look at the front of the knee. Uh, the front of the knee is where what's called the extensor mechanism is. And again, this is all superficial, just underneath the skin. Uh, here's your kneecap right in the middle, the big quad tendon. So there's four uh, muscles, the quadriceps muscles, and the tendons, by definition, connect the muscle to the bone. And then you have the patellar tendon. And that mechanism is what allows us to straighten the knee. But interestingly enough, a couple of the hamstrings come around uh, on the inside of the knee. So this is a right knee looking at it from the front. And these are the hamstrings that come around and attach to the front. Lateral collateral ligament, iliotibial band uh, here. And now we're gonna get to what we call the intraarticular structures, which are, which are the structures within the capsule of the knee. And so this is a right knee with the knee bent, looking at it from the front. We've taken away the patella and all the soft tissues. So there's four bones that make up the knee, the kneecap or patella, the femur, which is the big thigh bone, uh, the tibia, the shin bone, and the fibula. So there's four bones and there's four ligaments. And ligaments, by definition, connect the bones together. And that's what gives us stability. So when people get instability, it's usually from a ligament injury. And we have two on the sides called the collateral ligaments. Uh, this is the medial collateral ligament on the inside. It's the most commonly injured ligament in the knee. Uh, but it's outside of the knee joint uh, by definition. So it's in an environment that typically will heal on its own. And then the lateral collateral ligament is more of a cord-like structure on the outside, uh, and it's not uh, injured as commonly as the MCL. And the ones that really get all the attention uh, in the knee are the cruciate ligaments. You guys have probably all heard of the ACL or anterior cruciate ligament. And then that, that's this guy here, and they're called cruciates because they, they cross. The ACL is anterior in front of the PCL. It's smaller, not quite as strong, injured, um, much more frequently than the PCL. But its main function is to prevent the tibia, the lower bone in the knee, from coming forward on the femur. So that's why people get instability when they tear uh, the ACL. So four bones, four ligaments. There's two cartilages in the knee. Um, you have the smooth cartilage on the end of the bone, and you have it on the femur, under the kneecap, and on top of the uh, tibia. And, and that surface is a very efficient bearing surface. And when that smooth cartilage on the end of the bone wears out, that's what arthritis is. And what protects that cartilage is the meniscus. And we have two of those. You have a medial or inside meniscus and a lateral or outside. And if we look straight down onto the tibia, this is what the meniscus looks like. There are these circular structures. This is the medial 
and this is the lateral. And they act like shock absorbers, um, and they help uh, protect the smooth cartilage and distribute load in the knee. And then if we look at it arthroscopically, this is looking at the inside of the knee. This is what a normal meniscus and articular cartilage looks like. So this is the femur cartilage, which correlates to this, tibial cartilage, which is down here. And then this is the meniscus, the meniscus uh, being that shock absorber. So that's what a normal one looks like. Now, if we look at the smooth cartilage on the end of the bone, uh, something, uh, what's called the coefficient of friction that measures the efficiency of a material as a bearing surface. If you look at ice on ice, its coefficient of friction is 0 0.02. The cartilage on the end of our bones, it's 0 0.005. So that just tells you how efficient it is uh, as a bearing surface, even better than uh, ice on ice. And this is a very busy slide. Basically what it's showing is that uh, when you look at the biomechanics of the knee, there's a lot of stress on the cartilage on the end of the bones up to two to three times body weight between the femur and tibia with normal everyday activity. And it can go up to eight to 10 times body weight on the cartilage underneath the kneecap when we go up and down stairs or jumping type of activity. So there's a lot of stress on the articular cartilage. And that's one reason why it wears out over time because like any material, if you stress it repetitively, it's gonna wear out. So now that you're experts on anatomy, we'll uh, move on to the five most common causes of knee pain. Uh, that we see. Number one is overuse uh, syndromes, uh, such as tendonitis. Patellofemoral pain is pain from the kneecap. One of the most common causes of knee, knee pain we see, it's in the front of the knee. And again, it's overloading that cartilage on the undersurface uh, of the kneecap. Uh, iliotibial band, which runs on the outside of the knee, is a very common uh, source of knee pain as well. And then cartilage-wise, we, we'll talk about meniscus tears, articular cartilage injuries, We'll talk about ligaments, a uh, uh, quick uh, little delve into fracture, then we'll talk a little bit of arthritis. So those are the same five most, uh, cause, most common causes of knee pain that we see. And if we look at uh, overuse uh, syndromes, one of the more common ones is patellar tendonitis. So right below your kneecap, that patellar tendon, it's usually called jumpers or runner's knee. And it's inflammation of that tendon. Sometimes you can have little partial tears that try to heal, but they heal in with scar tissue. Um, but, but that's usually treated non-operatively with icing, anti-inflammatories, stretching, physical therapy. Sometimes uh, kinesio tape can help. Iliotibial band is more lateral pain or on the outside of the knee. Uh, the IT band is a structure that goes from our pelvis down to just below our knee, it attaches to the tibia. And the femur bone flares at the knee. So people that have tight hamstrings, tight IT bands, that do a lot of repetitive activities such as running or biking or even hiking downhill, if you have pain on the outside of your knee that you can pinpoint, put your finger on it, it hurts, it's probably iliotibial band syndrome. And again, just like patellar tendonitis, uh, almost always responds to non-operative treatment. Patellofemoral pain is overloading that cartilage under the kneecap. And one common cause is tight hamstrings, but it can also be due to maltracking of the kneecap, which is a very uh, complex function that I'm not going to get into in specifics, but it's a very common cause of knee pain. Again, most of the time uh, it will resolve with non-operative treatment. And now we're going to uh, look at that meniscus again. So this is that picture of looking at the cartilage that's normal and the meniscus cartilage, it's fibroelastic cartilage. It has what we call type one collagen. So it's a little different than the cartilage on the end of the bone. It's a type two collagen. Uh, it has very limited blood supply. So the part we're looking at does not have any blood flow. So the inner two thirds uh, does not have any blood flow. And the significance of that is that if you have a tear there, that it's very unlikely it's gonna heal itself if it doesn't have blood supply. And we talked about before that it transmits load. And, and we know that people that lose their meniscus are at much greater risk of uh, developing arthritis or wear and tear of this smooth cartilage uh, down the road. And so this is an MRI uh, looking at the right knee uh, from the side. So this is the front of the knee, the kneecap here, femur here, tibia. And this is a normal looking meniscus. We wanna see a triangle in the back and a triangle in front. Uh, but this is a torn meniscus on an MRI. This guy here should be back here. You can see 
how there's not much volume to that meniscus. And the way that looks like arthroscopically is this. So you guys are probably uh, tired of this slide, but this is the normal meniscus. And this is what that bucket handle tear looks like. You can see where it's torn in the back uh, and it's flipped uh, into the knee joint. Uh, and this can cause a lot of pain. And when we see bucket handle tears like this, uh, we're pretty aggressive about treating them. And we, we want to get to them early so that we can repair them and salvage uh, the meniscus. And most of the time, we're able to repair them arthroscopically like we did here. You can see the little stitches in the meniscus. Uh, and that way, we can preserve the cartilage. So... Uh, there's not increased stress on the smooth cartilage on the end of the bone. Some meniscus tears are different, though. The ones that occur uh, out um, in a, the central portion of the meniscus where the tissue isn't good and the blood flow is good. You can look at this tissue. This is a meniscus tear on the left. And even if I put a stitch in there, it would just come right out. There's not uh, good tissue to put the sutures in. So we do what's called a meniscectomy in this situation uh, where we go in and basically arthroscopically just trim up the meniscus uh, to give you a good stable rim. So we try to maintain or preserve as much of the meniscus as possible, but it's better to have a little less stable meniscus than to have a big tear in your knee because those rough edges over time are gonna rough up that smooth cartilage, which it's actually started to do in this knee where you can see that roughness. Now, less common is an injury to that articular cartilage. Uh, you can see this in isolation, but most of the time we'll see this when people have had other trauma to the knee, such as an ACL uh, injury. Uh, and we go in and we'll see a big flap where that smooth cartilage on the end of the bone is disrupted. And this cartilage has no blood supply, so it's not going to heal. If there's a piece of bone on the undersurface, then we could put it back and pin it. But most of the time, the cartilage delaminates from the bone, such as in this example. So what we do is we take that cartilage out, and this is just one option. This is called a microfracture. Maybe you guys have heard of this procedure. It's where we trim up the edges to get to a stable rim of meniscus, and then we poke holes to stimulate blood flow. And that blood flow will come into that defect, and basically it forms scar tissue in that defect. And the scar tissue it forms is type one collagen, uh, but we've learned already that the normal collagen is type two. And the significance of that is that it's not normal cartilage, and we have found over the years that these microfractures really only work for about five to seven years, uh, and then it'll start to wear out. So there's other things we can do. This is an example. If you look at the left side where there's a articular cartilage injury here. So what we do is we actually take plugs of cartilage and bone from a part of the knee where we really don't need it that much like we did here. And then what we do is we end up filling that gap or that defect with those plugs. And that's called an OATS procedure. Um, and it's very successful. And if these are even bigger, then rather than taking your own bone and cartilage, you can take a cadaver femur and just take one big plug. Uh, and that's a pretty common procedure for, for these injuries as well. And then another thing you can do, um, which we've done in the past, but it's not my preferred treatment because it's a two-procedure uh, procedure where you go in and scope the knee and you take a biopsy of the cartilage and you send it to a lab up in Boston. They grow cartilage cells. And then when we get to a certain threshold of cartilage cells, they send it back and we inject it uh, into the defect. So this is a defect in the cartilage that you can see right here. And then this is uh, injecting. What we do is we put a patch. It's a little different now. This is kind of more uh, old school where we would put a patch and sew it in and then we would inject the uh, cells underneath that patch to hold it there. Uh, it's still a very similar procedure, but now we uh, basically put those cells in the defect and cover it what's called fibrin glue uh, so that they don't um, extravasate uh, and go out into the joint. But this has been shown to be very successful for bigger defects, uh, defects bigger than uh, two and a half centimeters. Let me just see what's going on here. And so now we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about ligament injuries. And the MCL or the medial collateral ligament on the inside of the knee is the most commonly injured uh, ligament in the knee. Uh, the good news is that most MCL injuries, especially in isolation, will heal on their own uh, because it is technically outside of the knee joint. So it's not exposed to the same chemical and physical environment 
is like the anterior posterior cruciate ligaments. And that's why they typically don't heal on their own because they're intraarticular. But the MCL is extraarticular outside of the joint and it tends to heal. And this is a contact injury. You can see how uh, this one player fell on the knee, uh, causing the knee go in, uh, and that'll tear uh, the MCL. But generally we'll treat that with a brace, physical therapy, IC anti-inflammatories. They take about six or eight weeks to heal. Um, and generally they do well treating them non-operatively. Now the ACL uh, gets more attention than any other structure in the knee as far as sports medicine uh, is concerned. There's been probably about 6,000 articles written just on the ACL uh, alone. And anytime you have that many articles written, it's because we don't have a perfect treatment for it just yet. So there's many different ways to treat uh, an ACL tear these days. Um, so this is a picture of a normal ACL. Uh, this is a torn ACL, and this is a reconstructed ACL that's had surgery. And ACL injuries uh, occur in about one in 3,000 individuals, uh, much more common in the younger active age group. Women are at much greater risk than men of tearing their ACL, and we'll talk about the reasons why here in a minute. Um, and there's a lot of reconstructions done on an annual basis uh, in the United States. So the mechanism in skiing in this valley, uh, the most common is what's called the phantom foot syndrome. And this is when you get in the back seat, you're falling backwards, your hips get below your knees, you kind of fight that. And when you fight it, you have a tremendous quad contraction. And because the quadriceps attaches to the front of the tibia, it tends to uh, pull the tibia forward. So that puts a lot of stress on the ACL because that's what the ACL is trying to prevent. But also, typically, the downhill ski will catch an edge, and you'll get a rotational force. And because of the torque, because of the long skis, it's that combination of the quad contraction and the torque from the ski that tears uh, the ACL. In other sports, such as football, basketball, et cetera, um, I showed you that contact injury with the MCL. You can get contact ACLs as well but most ACL injuries are actually non-contact. They're more from a deceleration pivoting mechanism. And if we look at ACL tears by sport, uh, you can see that all of these sports, females are much more likely in basketball, volleyball, soccer, and in particular skiing to injure their ACLs. And these are the reasons why. There's, we talked about anatomy early on, uh, anatomical factors, so women have what's called a valgus knee, they're more knock kneed. And the reason they're more knock kneed is because they have wider pelvises because they give birth, men don't. But that alignment can put more stress on the knee. The notch where the ACL and PCL live uh, in that femur is narrower. Uh, so it can guillotine the ACL if you hyperextend your knee. Women have smaller ACL, so it doesn't take as much force to tear them. Uh, and the hormonal cycles that women go through uh, can make them susceptible for ACL tears. And functionally, uh, really the main reason that women tear is because of poor neuromuscular control, and especially landing mechanisms such as playing basketball or volleyball. Uh, and women as opposed to men are more uh, hyperlax, so their tissues aren't as stiff, so they're gonna stretch out easier uh, than a man's tissue. And this is the um, neuromuscular thing I was talking about. So 70% of these ACLs are non-contact. In this picture of this woman landing, that's poor biomechanics. So what's happening, this is what's showing you the schematic down below. Uh, the femur goes in, the tibia goes out, the tibia kind of rotates out. And what that does is puts a tremendous amount of stress on the ACL and it'll tear the ACL. So there have been ACL prevention uh, clinics and classes uh, that have significantly reduced ACL tears in the susceptible women, which are those uh, junior high, high school, college women athletes that are more uh, susceptible. And what they do is they teach them basically appropriate landing mechanism. And this is an appropriate landing mechanism here. You can see how the knees aren't together. They're further wide apart. Um, and this has significantly reduced the risk of ACL in uh, the high risk individual. So uh, how do we diagnose an ACL tear? Typically in my clinic, I can tell by history, just the patient telling me, hey, I was skiing, I felt backwards, I felt a pop, um, my knee was unstable, I couldn't ski down the hill. Uh, so, so just by listening, uh, we're able to make a diagnosis, but we always do a physical exam. 
Um, and a physical exam is very helpful, obviously. We check for swelling, range of motion, and there's some specific tests that we do to check for front to back stability. It's called a Lachman test. Um, and then we could do what's called a pivot shift that checks for rotational instability. And if you have a Lachman, positive Lachman, positive pivot, it's close to 100%, you're gonna have a torn uh, ACL. We do imaging as well, um, mainly MRIs. I don't know if you can see this MRI on my screen. Um, my face is over that uh, MRI, but that's a picture of a normal MRI. And then this one below is a torn ACL uh, where you can see the fibers here. We should see a nice black structure from the femur to the tibia. Here's uh, some fibers here and there's nothing in the middle. So that's a torn ACL. And the reason we get MRIs as well, because it's very uncommon for there to be an isolated ACL tear. ACL tears are generally associated with bone bruises. Other ligaments can be injured. You can get meniscus tears. You can get those articular cartilage injuries. So uh, no ACL tear uh, is, is alike. And so the treatment of ACL tears, a lot of it depends on the expectation uh, of the patient. Uh, if it's someone who's older, uh, they're really not into skiing or pivoting start-stop activities, and if they just want to bike, for example, and just hike, they may get by with just bracing and physical therapy. Uh, we call those copers, and, and there's copers out there that are even uh, skiing that are able to do their activities without an ACL, but it's really hard to predict who that coper is going to be. And if you're not a coper and you go out and try to do those activities and your knee gives out on you, then you're at significant risk of injuring the meniscus and other structures in, in the knee, and then your knee is just going to go downhill. So in most active individuals, uh, we do recommend surgery if you want to uh, remain active. Uh, recently, there's been a renewed interest in uh, repairing uh, the ACL. Uh, and this is, again, on my screen, my picture is right on this uh, picture. But a repair is where we put stitches into the remnants of the ACL stump and then attach it back to the femur. Uh, there's a new technique called the bear technique uh, where you put in a collagen implant uh, that allows it to heal as well. Uh, but the studies so far, as far as outcome, do not show any better results um, with a repair versus reconstruction. And still, in today's world, reconstruction is gold standard. Uh, for ACL surgery. And reconstruction basically just means they're using other tissue to act as a substitute for the ACL. So you basically take out the torn ACL and you put in other tissue. And the two main categories are autographs, which is your own tissue. And your own tissue, there's three main tissues we can use, the hamstring, patellar tendon, and quad. I have a lot of experience uh, with all of those, and I've kind of gone through an evolution uh, in my ACL treatment. Um, and I prefer the quad tendon uh, because it's strong. Uh, you don't have what's called the harvesite morbidity you do with a patellar tendon. Um, and it doesn't stretch out as much as a hamstring tendon. So the quad tendon is kind of my preferred autograft. But in people that are older, over 40, aren't quite as active, uh, but still a reconstruction is the best treatment for them, we would use cadaver tissue, which is called an allograft. And the cadaver uh, tissue these days uh, are very safe. There's no difference in infection rate between an aloe and an autograft, and we don't see rejection um, just because they're prepared so well these days. But no matter how you have your ACL reconstructed, if it's auto or allograft, it's still about a nine month uh, recovery till you're back doing everything. And the reason for that is really two main reasons. One, the graft that we put in your knee is very strong at the beginning, but then it undergoes a process called ligamentization where it gets its own blood supply and cell population. And during that transformation, it actually gets weaker. The patients don't know this because their knee continues to feel better because the swelling's going down, their motion's getting better, they're getting stronger. Um, but if they went back and did pivoting activities during that time, they'd be at significant risk of uh, re-tearing that graft. And it also takes about nine months for you to get your strength back in your quad and hamstring to protect your knee. And when I started, practice, we used to tell people six months, uh, full full activity after an ACL reconstruction. But we have, what we have found over the years is that if you go back at six months, your re-injury rate is up here. If you wait seven months, eight months, nine months, it's down there, and there's no difference after nine months. So nine months is kind of the uh, gold standard these days as far as getting back to full activity. Having said that, people are still very active in a modified way, uh, even before that nine-month time. 
And this is the quad tendon. This is uh, the quad tendon that we take from the patient's knee right above the kneecap. Uh, you can take this tissue. I like to take a little piece of bone off the kneecap because I like the bone to bone healing in uh, my femoral tunnel. But this is what a, a graph looks like. And this is us just preparing it on the back table. So this is an arthroscopic view uh, of a right knee. And what I'm looking at is we've cleaned out the ACL. And the most important thing technically is for us to put that ACL graft in, the, in an anatomic position. One of the main reasons these uh, procedures fail is if the surgeon does not put that graft in the proper spot. And so what I've kind of outlined is the anterior medial and posterior lateral bundles of the ACL. The ACL has two bundles. And even though we just make one socket, we try to incorporate kind of that area that gets both of those bundles when we drill it. And so this is what it looks like. Uh, again, this is the outline of the native ACL out here that we've cleaned off. So that tunnel to me is a perfect looking tunnel. That's right where we shoot for and want to be. And this is how we get the tunnel. We have these jigs um, that uh, make sure that we put these uh, little drill bits in the appropriate position and then we drill uh, our tunnel. We're able to do this through very small uh, little poke holes. And so this is kind of busy, but this is a torn ACL. This is after we've cleaned out the ACL, that femoral tunnel I showed you on the previous slide. We pass a suture through, and then we drill a tibial tunnel with this instrument. And then we basically just pass our graft up through the knee. And this is the little bone block going up into the femur. And then we um, portion of the graft is in the tibia. Uh, and this is what a ACL graft, this is an auto uh, quad graft looks like uh, when we're done. In the surgery, if you're just doing an ACL, it's about an hour procedure. If you have to do other work like the meniscus or repair other ligaments, obviously it's a little bit longer. But generally these surgeries, we're not around any major blood vessels or nerves, they're very safe. And because it's arthroscopic, the nature of that, we're running fluid through the knee, so we're washing the knee out and the chance of infection is almost unheard of. And it's pretty cosmetic. Most people don't care, but uh, some people do. So this is a right knee. Here's the kneecap. There's that little incision we make to get the quad tendon. Everything else is done arthroscopically through these little holes. And then there's a small incision on the tibia where we drill that tibial hole. And, you know, having a reconstructed ACL is not the end of the world. All of these famous athletes who you recognize uh, have had uh, reconstructed ACLs and have gone on to do great things. Uh, ironically, even this guy, uh, Ricky Rubio, uh, guarding Derek Rose, he, he even had an ACL reconstruction as well. And in our own valley, um, Chris Klug uh, won a uh, medal in the Salt Lake Olympics um, after a uh, significant knee injury. He not only had an ACL, he had a lateral collateral ligament, posterior lateral corner, uh, meniscus tear. Um, but th that's not nearly as significant um, or impressive as him also doing this uh, after obtaining a liver transplant. He was the first transplant recipient to uh, medal in Olympics, and maybe he's still the only one. Um, so this, this curve here just shows you, even though we're able to fix ACL tears, uh, if this is the normal curve for arthritis and you want it to be flat, this is if you need a total knee replacement is TKR. So if you tear your ACL, so this is age 40, say you do it at 20. So your risk of needing a total knee is seven times that of the normal population. What's even worse is if you have an ACL with a meniscus tear, you're 15 times more likely to need a total knee. So even doing a perfect surgery uh, does not prevent your knee from wearing out and getting arthritic uh, if you tear your ACL. So I'm gonna change gears real quick. We're gonna talk a little bit about fractures and, and this is kind of subtle, but it's kind of an interesting case. Uh, this was a ski injury that I took care of years ago. Um, she was a 50 some odd female that fell, came in. And you can see this is a right knee looking at it from the front and the inside, you can see this line here, that's a normal knee. See how you really don't see that white line here? And that's because this white line on the inside is down here. So she has what we call a tibial plateau fracture. You can subtly see it here and you can really see it great on the MRI. This is looking at the MRI from the front of a right knee. So this is the MCL, this is the meniscus, femur, tibia. And what happens in these injuries, the femur comes down like a hammer on the tibia and the femur is a denser, stronger bone. So it always beats up the tibia. Uh, and you can see how that cartilage is pushed down. And 
we did this arthroscopically. So we went in with the scope and this is what it looked like. This is normal articular cartilage and you can see how beat up this is. Here's the meniscus. And so we have arthroscopic ways of elevating up all those fragments, which we did here. So this is after we elevate it, we, we put some bone underneath to act like a scaffolding to help hold it up. And then we fix it with a couple of screws. And you can see the alignment, the, the white, this black line on this image you see here. So we were able to reconstitute her joint line. Um, so a very satisfying case. The interesting about it is that she came back 14 years later and we took these x-rays and this is looking at the knees from the front, like I'm standing in front of her. So this to the left is actually the right knee, to the right is the left knee. And if you look at the outside, the, the distance between the femur and tibia, you can see how it's narrowed compared to the left knee. So 14 years later, she was, uh, she was the, uh, sorry, cleaning ladies are here. Um, 14 years later, she started to develop some arthritis. So anytime you have an injury to that smooth cartilage uh, and it's disrupted, again, if you reconstitute it, uh, it's still at increased risk of developing some arthritis. But the reason she came and saw me later because she had a new injury and she had a meniscus tear. So we were able to go back in and look at it again. And you can see that cartilage here. It's a little bit beat up, but overall it looks, looks pretty good. And this is just me uh, cleaning up the little bit of meniscus tear. Uh, that she had. As far as I know, uh, she's done well since then. So one of, one of the big things these days, because we're all living longer, uh, we want to stay active as we get older, is knee arthritis. And one way to think of the knee is like an organ, like you would your kidneys, your liver, or your heart. I know that sounds crazy, uh, but the knee really is like an organ if you think about it. And when it wears out and that articular cartilage wears out, that's organ failure. And if you look at uh, the knee when it wears out, this is what it looks like. And you get exposed bone, the smooth cartilage is worn out. And again, that smooth cartilage has no nerve endings. We don't feel anything, but when it wears out and the bone is exposed, there's a ton of nerve endings in the bone. It's very sensitive. It's like a raw wound. So every time you're stepping on it, it's very painful. And this is just an arthroscopic view of some roughness of the cartilage. Um, and this is from 2012, uh, but it's very relevant today and it's busy, but I'll explain it to you. So if you look at prevalence, uh, how common something is, and you look at age, this top line is arthritis. So arthritis overall is more prevalent than coronary or heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and depression. But this is the important line here, because if you get over this line, which arthritis is, it affects your quality of life. So your activities of daily living, are affected uh, in arthritis. Basically what it shows is that arthritis more than these other diseases affect someone's quality of life more. And arthritis is the leading cause of physical disability in the US. Uh, over 50 million people in the US have it. And if you live long enough, if you live to be 75 or older, uh, you have about a 50% chance of developing arthritis uh, in your knee or hip. And it's very expensive to treat because it's so common. Uh, these days, it's probably about $500 billion a year in total cost annually just to treat in direct and indirect costs, indirect costs being loss of work and productivity, et cetera. And the problem with arthritis is that there is no way to prevent it, and we really don't have a cure. The only cure is a replacement, um, which is like a tra heart transplant or a kidney transplant. Um, but the symptoms are pain, swelling, stiffness, deformity, you can get angular malalignment deformities, decreased activity, which is gonna to lead to weight gain because it just hurts to be active. And this can lead to or worsen depression, diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension. So how do we manage it? You know, initially, if it's mild or moderate, uh, we certainly try uh, non-invasive techniques such as weight loss. And these days it's easier than ever to lose weight. Uh, you can just take a pill these days. You don't even have to work out or you know, modify your diet if you don't have to. Uh, activity modification is important. So, for example, if you were a runner and did a lot of repetitive impact, maybe try swimming or biking. Won't put as much stress on the knees. Physical therapy is helpful. Uh, ice, non-steroidals like Motrin, Advil, Leave, Tylenol if you don't tolerate those. And sometimes we'll do bracing if people have malalignment. Sometimes we'll put a little heel wedge in the shoe to subtly change uh, the alignments like a poor man's brace. So those are all non-invasive 
uh, modalities we have to treat arthritis. We do a lot of injections in my practice. Uh, still, the most common are steroid-based, uh, but there's some newer steroid-based injections, which are longer acting, slower release, so they're not as destructive to the smooth cartilage. Because if you uh, do more than three to four steroid injections a year in the knee, then it can actually accelerate wear of that articular cartilage. Uh, we do a lot of what's called hyaluronic acid, which is like a lubricant shock absorber uh, injection. Um, and we do biologics uh, like PRP, um, stem cells are available as well that you could get either from the bone in the pelvis, or you could do like a little micro liposuction and get it from the fat. Uh, and those are, are all approved. And if all that fails, then, then surgery again is kind of like in orthopedics, uh, joint, uh, organ transplant for us is doing a knee replacement. And these are just the injection therapies that we talked about. I uh, won't get into that. I'll talk a little bit about uh, total joint replacement. Uh, these days, there's probably about a million uh, total knee replacements done annually in the United States, and you can see how it's increasing and increasing every year. Uh, and the reason for that is that we're living longer, even though in the last few years, actually, life expectancy in the United States has gone down a little bit because of COVID, um, drug use, suicide. Uh, but generally, kind of like the stock market, it just keeps going up with time. And we want to stay active as we get older. This is a guy named Fauja Singh, who was the first 100-year-old uh, to run a marathon. And when, apparently when he was 92 years old, he ran a five and a half hour uh, marathon. I'd, I'd probably be on mile three by then. Uh, so that's pretty impressive. And also, uh, you know, now with Ozempic and all those drugs, it's not as big a deal, uh, but we're a fat country in the United States. So this is kind of our progression. Um, and so obesity and that increased weight uh, is huge because like I tell my patients, if you're overweight, that's always a difficult conversation to have with a patient. But for every pound that you lose, it's like four pounds coming off the knee. That's, that's how the uh, biomechanics of it all work. And so this is what arthritis looks like. So that smooth cartilage on the end of the bone, that articular cartilage doesn't show up on x-ray. It's what we call radiolucent. That's why the, this is the right knee again. Uh, so that's why the outside of this knee, there's good spacing because there's good cartilage. But when it wears out, you see this bone on bone. So that's how we're able to diagnose arthritis looking at x-rays. And then if someone has just isolated medial compartment, this is a right knee also, we can go in and do a partial replacement. So all we're doing is replacing the bad cartilage on the femur and on the tibia, and we put a little plastic piece in the middle. And this is what it looks like. And that's a, a wonderful operation uh, for people that are appropriate for that. I like to do these surgeries robotically, uh, which what we call the macoplasty. We've been doing that since 2010, so we have a lot of experience. Um, we were one of the first hospitals uh, between, I think we were the first hospital between um, Denver and Salt Lake City to use the robot back in the day. So we have a lot of history with it. And with the robot, we're able to do hip replacements, which I don't do, but I have partners that do that, partial replacements. And uh, initially it was just for partial, uh, but it's only been now the last six or seven years that we've been able to do total knee replacements with the robot. And the technology is pretty amazing. This We do a preoperative CAT scan, so we're able to see the bone in three dimensions. So we're able to put the components exactly where we want them and where is appropriate even before we cut skin. So this is us putting the components on the CT scan. And this is doing it with a uh, total knee replacement. Um, and this is just showing how we cut the bone. So the bone that we cut uh, comes up as green and we just want to get rid of all the green. And uh, these are little arrays that we attach to the femur and tibia. And there's one on the robot. And that's how we communicate with the robot and the computer uh, through infrared light. And this is actually a picture back in the day. This was one of our fellows, Dan Lee. I think this was actually back our very first one that we did in 2010. And then with a partial, we use these components. That's the tibial, femoral, and that little plastic piece goes between them. And that's what it looks like uh, four weeks post-op. Partial knees, uh, if you're the right individual. Uh, one thing I didn't mention on the anatomy of the knee that was important is the knee has three compartments, the medial or inside, lateral or outside, and that patellofemoral compartment. And if you have decent motion and stability, only one compartment is involved, then you're a candidate for a partial.
And this is more involved. You can see how there's some subluxation where the tibia is not completely under the femur. So there's probably a, a ligament uh, that's lax and that was torn in the past and just more advanced arthritis. So someone like that, we would use kind of the same instrumentation, uh, but we would do a total knee. And this is just a video. Hopefully it'll come up. You can see in the left-hand corner, the green, this is the saw blade. And so I'm looking up at that screen uh, when I'm cutting the bone. So this is Rachel, my PA. Uh, you can see I'm using that saw blade to get rid of the green because um, the software tells me what bone and how much bone uh, to cut off. So it's very accurate, precise, and reproducible. That's why I like it. It really takes out a lot of the subjectivity, makes the procedure a lot more objective. And then this is just a total knee replacement uh, in place. And this is what a total knee uh, looks like once we're done. And this is the incision. Um, they all heal well, uh, good range of motion. And just like I showed you with the ACL reconstruction, these are all people that you recognize that have had uh, total knee replacements uh, from professional athletes to rock stars, Hollywood stars, politicians uh, that go on and live very active lifestyles after a total knee replacement. And in my population, everybody skis. I let them ski. Um, they pretty much do everything. The only thing I don't want them to do is run for exercise because that repetitive impact, I'm worried that that'll uh, loosen that interface between the metal and the bone uh, and get really loosening. So I just don't want people to run. Um, but skiing used to be kind of taboo with a total knee, but I've been doing these for almost 30 years now. And and I don't think our loosening rate is any higher than anybody else's around the country. Um, last year, uh, we had a patient that gave us a call because he was having a award ceremony at the at the base of uh, the gondola at Aspen Mountain because we had done a total knee on him 10 years ago and he has skied at least 100 days a year since his knee replacement. Uh, so he was getting an award because he skied over uh, a thousand days in the last 10 years. So he invited us to come, which was, uh, which was kind of cool. So people are very active is the point. So kind of in summary with arthritis, what seems to work the best, we always try non-operative treatment, uh, over-the-counter medications. Uh, occasionally we'll prescribe tramadol, uh, which is a pain med, uh, people really uh, having a hard time uh, sleeping, et cetera, and aren't quite ready for surgery. We correct the alignment with the braces or the heel wedge when appropriate. We do a lot of uh, injection therapy. Um, and if that doesn't work, then uh, surgery is the last option. So I'm done with my talk. Uh, again, I uh, hope you guys uh, have put in some questions. Uh, some of those have probably been answered already uh, and I'll answer some of those myself. Um, I would also, one, like to thank you uh, if you're still online uh, for the attention. I uh, hope you got uh, some good information uh, out of this. Um, and if you have questions that come up in the next day or so, feel free to email us and we will get back to you. Um, and the next webinar, so you guys know, in orthopedics will be on March 6th. Dr. Leota is going to talk about shoulder uh, dislocation. So Tito Leota, March 6th. So look out for that. And uh, also on March 18th, the GI gastroenterology clinic will have a webinar on prevention of uh, colorectal cancer. Um, and that one's going to be on March 18th. So we're still on. So if you're still putting questions in, that's great. Um, I'm just going to stop the video and uh, mute myself. So uh, th thank you again for your attention. All right, Dr. Pevney, we do have a couple questions that we would like to answer live. Okay. And so the first one, um, Tamara asked earlier in your presentation, how can you tell if your knee pain is from arthritis or another condition or injury? Uh, that's a good question. Um, a lot of it depends on just the individual. One is the age. If someone comes in who's 20, 30, 40, chances are they're not going to have arthritis. I mean, we do see that, but it's very uh, unlikely and unusual. Um, many times uh, we categorize the knee pain in terms of traumatic so if someone had 
you know, a normal knee and they had a fall or a twist, then I know that's going to be a cartilage injury or a ligament injury, more than likely. Um, and a ligament injury is what we call a knee sprain. Um, if it's someone who's a little bit older, they've had previous surgery on their knee, they've had previous injuries, and the, the pain is worsening over time, especially weight-bearing activity, such as walking uh, or running, uh, then that what's what makes me think of arthritis. Um, and then based on our physical exam, uh, you know, we check for swelling, we check range of motion, we check for stability, but we also check for what's called crepitus. So when someone actively straighten and bends their knee, I'll put my hand on their knee. And if someone has arthritis, it feels like snap, crackle, pop. We call that crepitus. And that's because that smooth cartilage, if it's normal, we're not going to feel anything because it's so efficient as a bearing surface. But if it starts to wear out, it's like sandpaper on sandpaper. It's very rough. So if I see that on physical exam, I'm going to know uh, it's arthritis. And then um, most patients will get imaging on, and you can tell from plain x-rays, you don't need an MRI generally uh, to diagnose arthritis. I hope that answers your question. All right. And the second question that we have so far is Tara had asked a question earlier tonight regarding iliotibial band syndrome. Can you speak about kind of what patients deal with with regards to iliotibial band syndrome as well as a recovery, what that looks like? Yeah, so iliotibial band um, is, again, pain on the outside of the knee. And the iliotibial band actually can cause pain on the outside of your hip, too, because that band starts on the pelvis, and the femur bone kind of flares or gets wider in two areas, right below the hip joint, and that's where the IT band can rub. And there's something called a bursa, which we have all over our body. Bursas are like little lubricants, um, and sometimes they get inflamed and can be uh, very painful. And around the knee, it happens where the femur bone flares. And if someone has a tight iliotibial band, and generally if someone has a tight IT band, they're gonna have tight hamstrings. A lot of times they'll have a tight lower back as well, or have some lower back achiness and issues there. Um, and it's with repetitive activity like running, biking, hiking, they're gonna notice pinpoint pain on the lateral or outside part of your knee where you can actually touch it uh, and it hurts. So when someone comes in with pain there, we go through our, our whole uh, workup. Um, we get a good history, a good physical exam to rule out, because there's a lot of other things on the outside of the knee that can cause pain. Like you could have a lateral collateral ligament injury, which is uncommon. And usually that's associated with trauma, not repetitive use. The lateral meniscus lives out there. Uh, so that can cause uh, pain as well. There's a little unique tendon in the back part of the knee called the popliteus or popliteus, how some people say it, that can get inflamed and cause pain as well. But usually based on the history and based on our physical exam, we're able to pinpoint exactly where it's coming from. And generally, if you don't have any other issues, you're gonna have normal x-rays with IT band syndrome. Um, but almost always it responds to icing, anti-inflammatory medication, in a good physical therapy program. And the physical therapy, they do a lot of different things. It's not just strengthening and stretching. A lot of it is stretching the IT band. And there are specific stretches you can do. I mean, you could Google it and it'll show you four or five stretches even online that are easy that you can do on your own. But they can also do what we call modalities. They can do something called iontophoresis where they use anti-inflammatory creams with electrical stimulation that really gets a good strong anti-inflammatory right around that bursa. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that um, the physical therapist can do. Um, and very rarely, uh, I'd say in my career, uh, which is now spanning close to 30 years here in the Valley, a handful where I've had to go in and release the IT band. And when I say release it, what we do is when we do go in and operate on it, we make a small little incision right over that point of maximum tenderness. And we basically excise a little diamond-shaped piece of the IT band where it's rubbing on the bone. But most of the time, it, it's kind of like a tennis elbow. Uh, if you've ever had that uh, with stretching and icing, that tends to go away with time. It's kind of a self-limiting thing. And it's very similar with the IT band syndrome as well. All right. And uh, another question for you is, 
Is arthritis caused from overuse or is it more hereditary? Uh, yeah, another good question. It, it definitely is hereditary. Uh, if you have uh, family members, mother, father, et cetera, that have a history of arthritis, you're definitely more likely uh, to get it. Uh, it. It's not really an overuse thing. I mean, if you, there's people that have run their whole life that, that don't get arthritis, uh, but those are the lucky ones that have good alignment, good flexibility, good strength in the muscles uh, around their knee. Um, so it's usually a, either a hereditary thing um, there's the main things that cause arthritis are one is genetics, which you have no control over these days. Uh, number two, which we see a lot of is post-traumatic. So like I showed you how increased risk individuals are if they tear their ACL or have a meniscus tear. So I see a lot of that in my practice. So we call that post-traumatic arthritis or even that x-ray I showed you of the lady that had that subtle tibial plateau fracture. Um, you can get inflammatory arthritis. So people that have rheumatoid arthritis, um, lupus, all those autoimmune uh, disorders, scleroderma, et cetera, uh, that can cause inflammation uh, and arthritis uh, in the knee joint. And you can get infectious arthritis. Say you're very unlucky and you go in for an ankle or a knee scope, you have an arthroscopy and you develop uh, an infection uh, that infection can uh, wear down and eat away that smooth cartilage on the end of the bone and cause uh, arthritis. So genetics, post-traumatic, inflammatory, uh, infectious. And, and we call it, when you just get it, and usually it's more of a hereditary thing, but there's been no trauma, you don't have a history of autoimmune disorders, it's what we call idiopathic. It just, it, you know, it happens. And some of it is alignment. You know, people that are significantly bow-legged, which we call varus or knock-kneed, um, because that malalignment over time, again, the repetitive use in that ind individual could lead to wear and tear. Um, but again, if you have normal alignment, just repetitive use in itself is not going to cause arthritis. All right, that is it for our questions for this evening. All right. Well, thank you guys uh, again, and I hope you guys show up on March 6th for Dr. Leota's presentation. Thank you.